pin this to my pocket. <laughs> I'm kidding. Oh. <laughs> Please stand and join us. privilege and joy it is to know that the Almighty God calls us friends, uh, that He loves us 
in that way. Uh, and it is our prayer, it is our desire that if you don't know Jesus, if you don't know God in this way, that God would work in your life and work in your heart, that you would know him as your Lord, as your Savior, and as your friend. Amen. Well, I'm Pastor Matt, and I want to welcome all of you uh, here this morning. It's so great to gather with all of you. Uh, I enjoy uh, this time so much. I look forward to it each and every week, and I pray that you do too. Uh, If you are a guest with us, uh, we want to extend a special welcome uh, to you. We're so thankful you've chosen to worship with us this morning. And if you uh, miss the Welcome Center on your way in, uh, we encourage you just to take a moment and fill out one of these uh, connection cards. You should find one tucked into the seat Uh, in front of you, and uh, we encourage you to take a moment, fill it out, and then as the offering plate comes by later in the service, uh, place it in the offering plate or just leave it in your seat, and uh, one of us will grab it uh, uh, after the service. And this is our way of of getting to know you, of connecting in with you, Um, and so we encourage you as your first step uh, to get connected into our church to fill out this connection card. And then the second step is to learn more about our church. Uh, You can do this in several ways, through our Facebook page, through our website, Uh, One of our pastors will take one of these cards and follow up with you uh, this week and seek to grab coffee or ice cream or or lunch with you, and so we can get to know you. And then finally, we encourage you uh, to join a small group. Uh, This is the best way to get connected into our church, to grow in your relationship with Jesus. And uh, we have, uh, you can either text the word GROW to the number on the screen, uh, or you can sign up in our uh, ministry resource center right outside these doors. Uh, Well, uh, one of the ways that we show Christ's love to each other is by greeting one another. And so if you're in uh, gathering with us in person, we encourage you to share Christ's love with someone sitting next to you. If you're gathering with us online, uh, we encourage you to uh, text or give a quick call to someone uh, that you know uh, that could use a word of encouragement, but share Christ's love uh, with those around you at this time. stuff up here too. I've been trying to keep a basket of stuff. I have do you want the halls? I have got some. I have a bag in my thing just because I like this. It is, but we shouldn't. True. It is indeed great to be back in fellowship with one another, and I can tell that we've missed one another, and that is a great thing. It's great for the family of God to be together, so I say good morning to all of you, good morning to our friends and family in the balcony, and we just want to take a few moments to highlight some of our announcements this morning. One is that we are still looking for people to volunteer to serve in the kids' wings. And you can see Becky, she's right back there, uh, waving her arm. If you can't see her on, in, from the balcony, you can email her. At, it's up on the screen, Becky S at fbc-musc.com. We're grateful for your, your, ser- your acts of service. Um, I will be taking the order form out of the resource room for t-shirts, sweatshirts. Um, You can pay me in cash. You can write a check to Berlin Pro Shop, and we'll get those in, and hopefully we'll have them within the next couple of weeks for you. Um, We just want to remind you that our Easter offering is coming up in a couple of weeks. 
And um, this is going to go towards to help Miss Emma Maynard as she's going on a uh, overseas mission trip. So we're very excited to be able to support her and proud of her serving in this capacity. And uh, we just praise God for you and pray that you'll have a good worship service. Please stand and join us again. built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest Yeah. Mm -hmm.
was buried beneath my shame. Can we clap with this one? It seems like it needs to clap. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my tomb. Until I met you. I was breathing when I
Good morning. Would you all please join me as we read the scripture passage today? Uh, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14 is where I'll start. And I'll go through chapter 5, verse 10. Again, that's Hebrew, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14. If you need a Bible, there are some under the chairs in front of you. If you happen to grab the large print version, we're on page 1,189. The small print version, we're on page 1,003. All right, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. For every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can deal gently with the ignorant and wayward, since he himself is beset with weakness. Because of this, he is obligated to offer sacrifice for his own sins, just as he does for those of the people. And no one takes this honor for himself, but only when called by God, just as Aaron was. So also Christ did not exalt himself to be made a high priest, but was appointed by him who said to him, you are my son, today I have begotten you. As he says also in another place, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him, being designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. The word of the Lord. What is something you would say you are really bad at? I'll give you a little bit of time to think about that. Some of you may need more time than others, depending on the level of pride. But what is something you would say that you are really bad at? For me, I, I could spend the whole rest of the sermon uh, giving you answers for myself. Uh, but I was trying to think of something that I'd be a little bit uh, more ashamed of. And the, the answer that I came up with is, I'm really bad at long-distance friendships. All right? So I, I tend to be one of those uh, out of sight, out of mind people. And so uh, Jen and I, we've moved several times uh, throughout the course of our marriage, and Jen has maintained at least one or two friendships from each one of those moves. And so she'll text those girls uh, about once a month or every other month or call them on the phone. Uh, for me, it's more like the person texts me or messages me or emails me and says, hey, it has been a long time. We should catch up. And I'm like, oh yeah, we should. Like That would be a, that would be a great idea. Uh, so I'm really bad at long distance friendships. Well, we all have things that we're bad at. Uh, maybe we're bad at cooking or sports or singing or writing or speaking or acting or matching clothes. I'm not going to look at any of you as I say that last one. No judgments here. But we're going to see in Hebrews today that there is something that each one of us here is bad at. And that's being a high priest. More specifically in today's passage, the big idea that we're going to see is that Jesus is a better high priest than any of us. Again, Jesus is a better high priest than any of us. 
As we spend time in today's word, we're going to see what is meant by that statement. And so if right now you're thinking, man, I, I have no idea what that means up there, that's okay. We're, we're going to study that in today's passage, and we're going to see that this is actually good news for each one of us. And so will you join with me now in praying for God to work in us this morning through his word? Father, we thank you so much uh, for gathering us together to worship. And Father, what a joy it is to gather together, uh, whether in person, whether uh, online this morning. Uh, Father, we thank you that we can uh, be one body uh, together, joyfully singing your praise, rejoicing at the good work that you have done for us through your Son, Jesus Christ. And we pray that the rest of this service would just continue to be an act of worship to you, uh, that you'd be glorified in all that we say and all that we do and all that we give um, as we worship you uh, this morning. Father, we uh, continue to pray for our church family that is gathering with us in the balcony. We pray for continued wisdom uh, for them as they make decisions on when to rejoin us. Uh, Father, may they know that we miss them greatly. Father, we know uh, that you are working in them, that you are comforting them, that you are uh, being near to them, and we thank you for that. Uh, Father, we pray that you would help us to gather them, uh, that soon we would all be together uh, worshiping in this place again. Uh, Father, as we approach your word this morning, as we continue our time in the book of Hebrews, we pray that you would give us humility. Uh, Father, it is really hard for us to admit that there are things that we are bad at. We spend so much time trying to cover up our failures, trying to cover up our flaws, trying to uh, give off this persona that we have everything together. And so, Father, as we even think of admitting that we are a bad high priest, uh, Father, we, we pray that you would give us the humility to do that. Uh, and we pray that you would give us clarity. Um, for, Father, there are many, maybe many of us who aren't even familiar with this concept of a high priest. And so, Father, uh, would you give us receptant hearts uh, to your word uh, this morning? And Father, in the end, would you give us all joy uh, that we would see Jesus as the better option, as the better high priest. And then, Father, every time we need a high priest, we would run to him, that we would trust in him, and uh, we would be experience uh, your blessing for that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, in order to first understand how Jesus is a better high priest than us, we must first know what a high priest does. And so, uh, we could go back through several Old Testament passages. I'm just going to, uh, for the sake of time, kind of summarize what a high priest did and who they were. And so if you look up with me at the screen, we'll see several descriptions of a high priest. So a high priest was chosen by God. So it wasn't anything where a priest was elected uh, by the people. Uh, he was chosen by God. And so uh, Aaron, uh, if we remember our study from the book of Exodus, Aaron was the first high priest, and then uh, you had the Levite family was uh, from our study of Joshua. The, the Levite family um, followed in his footsteps. And so they served as priests. Um, and then out of these priests, there was always one high priest. And we'll see what the distinction was between them in a little bit. Um, the high priest served in the temple. Uh, so the, the main place where God's uh, glory dwelt. Uh, so he served in the temple. And then he performed various duties. So he performed sacrifices. He burned incense. He offered gifts. He helped teach the law, um, along with all the other priests that served at the time. And together, they represented the people before God. Okay, so the priest wasn't in the temple offering sacrifices just for himself or offering up prayers just for himself. They represented the people before God. And so the people would bring to the priest uh, a sacrifice for their sins, or they would bring to the priest the Thanksgiving offering, or they would bring to the priest a tithe, or they would bring to the priest the prayer request. And the priest would go before God's presence, and he would offer these things on behalf of the people. So they represented the people before God. And here's where the distinction came between the high priest and the rest of the priests. So again, there was one priest, and on the day of atonement, so the day, the one day out of the year where they would offer one sacrifice for the sins of the people, the high priest alone would offer that sacrifice. And so he would go into the innermost part of the temple uh, called the most holy place or the holy of holies, and he would offer that sacrifice uh, on behalf of the people. And the high priest alone could go into that inner part of the temple and only on the Day of Atonement. Now, some of you may have grown up in the Catholic tradition, or some of you may have grown up in a highly anti-Catholic tradition such that you know all the things about uh, the Catholic Church. 
And so you may, be, you may have come out of this adopting this mindset that we don't need a priest, all right? We don't need a priest anymore, all right? Well, that is partially true, all right? It's true in the sense that we don't need a human priest here on earth uh, in order to have access to God, in order to offer sacrifices to us, or sacrifices on our behalf, in order to offer prayers on our behalf, in order to forgive us of our sins. But we still need a high priest. The difference is that high priest is Jesus, all right? And so all of our prayers are heard because Jesus serves as our high priest. All of our sin is atoned for because Jesus serves as our high priest. And so we still need a priest acting on our behalf. We just have that person already, and his name is Jesus. And so the decision that you and I are going to be confronted with in this passage is not do we need a high priest or not, but whether we will trust Jesus as our great high priest or whether we will be more likely to trust ourselves to serve in that role. And we're going to see in today's passage why it is such a greater idea, a better idea to have Jesus serving in that role on our behalf. In this passage alone, there are five reasons why we should trust Jesus as our high priest. And so let's uh, get into those as we work our way through this passage. The first is that Jesus has better access to the Father than we do. In chapter 4, verse 14, we see that we have a great high priest who is Jesus, who has passed through the heavens, heavens being plural. And that may seem strange to all of us because we generally believe there's how many heavens? One, all right? That's the place where God the Father dwells. That's the place where Jesus sits next to God the Father at the right hand. Uh, that's the place where the angels are. It's the place where some of our loved ones are. We generally think of one heaven. But to Jews, they believed or they called three different places heaven. Uh, the first heaven was what we call our sky or our atmosphere. All right? So that was their first heaven. The second heaven is what we call space. Uh, so as you think of outer space, that's what they called the second heaven. And the third heaven was what we actually call heaven. So the place where God dwells. And so they're saying that Jesus has passed through all of these heavens. So when he ascended into heaven, when he rose from the dead and ascended to heaven, he went through the atmosphere, through space, and is now in heaven, seated next to the Father. Why does all this matter? Well, because Jesus doing this was the fulfillment of what a high priest would do. In order to gain access to the Holy of Holies, the innermost part of the temple, he would have to pass through three different areas. He would have to go through the outer courts where all the sacrifices, all the animals uh, were offered for daily sins. And then he would pass through into the holy place, which is where prayers were offered and incense was burned. And then he would end up in the most holy place on the Day of Atonement when that one sacrifice for the sins of the people were offered. And so the author of Hebrews is saying that just as that high priest passed through these three areas and how has access to God. Now he's offering the sacrifice. He's, he's in that most holy place where God dwells in this special way. And he's before the face of God. And he's offering sacrifices for the sins of the people. So Jesus has passed through all three heavens. And is now right before the Father. He's before the face of God. He has access to the Father. Just as the people had access to God through the priest in the Old Testament. All of our prayers and all of our pleas for mercy are now being heard because Jesus is before the face of the Father. Think about that, church. Every single prayer you offer heard by the God of heavens because of Jesus. Every single time you sin and you need forgiveness and you pray to God, God, have mercy on me. Forgive me of the sin. It's heard because Jesus is before the face of of our Father in heaven every single time. But yet, if we're being honest, there are many times in our lives when we question whether our prayers really are being heard. God, it seems like you are far off. God, it, it doesn't seem like you are near in this moment. Are you really hearing this prayer that I'm offering? Or is this falling on deaf ears? 
God, are you really going to help me out in this situation that I am? Father, did you really hear my prayer for forgiveness that I offered yesterday? Because I still feel guilty. I still feel shame. If you ever had any of those thoughts go through your head, it means that in that moment, you are functioning as your own high priest. We are trusting in our abilities, our own worthiness, in order to have our prayers heard before God. And so when we're struggling with sin or we're feeling like a failure or not getting what we're asked for, we question, God, are you near? Because it, I, just, I just don't feel like I'm worthy enough to be in your presence. I don't feel like I'm worthy enough to have my prayers offered. I, I, I feel like this guilt, this shame it should, should keep me far from you. But I don't feel like you're near. And that's exactly why you and I need to trust Jesus as our high priest because he is always near to the Father. He was always before the face of the Lord, regardless of whether you and I are living a righteous week or whether we are living an unrighteous week. Jesus is always near. He always has access to the Father. Through him, our prayers for help are always heard. Through him, our prayers for forgiveness are always heard. Every single one of them. Jesus has better access to the Father than we do because he is always before the face of God. Many of us have applied for jobs before. And you guys know that there is a huge difference between applying for a job where you know no one in the company and there's no one who can advocate for you and knowing applying for a job where you know someone who is helping make that decision for that hire. You have an advocate on the inside who is going to make sure that your resume is seen, make sure that it is given time and attention, who is going to advocate and say, hey, I really think it would be a good idea to hire this person. Church, Jesus is that advocate for us on the inside. Without him, when you and I try to serve as our high priest, our prayers, our petitions, our pleas for forgiveness, our pleas for help is like a stack of resumes that just keeps building up and we should live in anxiety, we should live in worry. Is, is, is my prayer going to get heard? But Jesus is the one who is always before the Father who makes sure every prayer request gets to him and every plea for mercy gets to him. Jesus is our advocate on the inside. He is our better high priest. God is always near to us because Jesus is always before the face of God. Let us trust him as our high priest. Secondly, Jesus is a better high priest because he knows our temptations and weaknesses better than we do. We see this in verse 15 where the author writes, excuse me, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Every high priest in the Old Testament was uh, prone to sin themselves. They struggled with the same temptations that everyone else did. It's not like Jesus chose them just because they were the most holy people. Jesus, uh, they struggled with the same sins, the same temptations as everyone else. They were tempted to make judgments on other people. They te were tempted to covet possessions that weren't theirs. They were tempted to take God's name in vain, to work on the Sabbath. But what that enabled them to do is to sympathize with the weaknesses of the people. Imagine for a moment that you had a high priest who was perfect, who had never sinned, and all day long he, you had people coming up to you and saying, I need you to offer this prayer because I need help. I need you to offer this sacrifice for sin because I've committed this sin. And then the next day, I need you to offer another sacrifice for that sin. That perfect person would be like, are you serious? Every single day you're here. Every single day you have another prayer request. Every single day you sin. You need to get your life together just like me. But because each one of these high priests struggled with sin, they were able to sympathize with the people. And they were saying, man, yeah, you struggle with that? I, I do too. Lord, please give us mercy. Oh, you need help for that? Man, I do too. Lord, please help us in this time. It enabled them to better serve the people because they were able to sympathize with their needs. And the author of Hebrews makes the case that the same is true for us with Jesus as our high priest. He came down to earth to face the same kind of temptations from the evil one that we do. Jesus was tempted to live according to his own ways. 
he was attempted to seek power here on earth. And I'm sure there was probably a time or two where Jesus was tempted to take the Lord's name in vain when his disciples weren't understanding, when they were failing to listen to him. And in fact, Jesus faced these temptations to an even greater degree than what you or I did. Think about this. How many of you guys have ever had a mom or a dad uh, early afternoon bakes a cake or a pie or a pan of brownies? All right? So they do this early in the afternoon, and you're hungry, you're smelling them, and you're thinking to yourself, oh, I've got to have one right now. And they say, not till dinner. All right? Maybe you have friends coming over, maybe it's just uh, the topping of, of the meal, but they say, not till dinner. All right? Which is harder? To give in to that temptation right at 2 o'clock or right at 3 o'clock and have a piece of pie, have a brownie, or to wait and to wait and to wait and to wait till dinner. It's the latter. Because you face that temptation all afternoon. Every time you come into that kitchen, you face that temptation. Oh, I just really want one. No one will even notice. If I just take a little bit off the top, no one will even notice. I'll just eat one of these edge pieces because no one ever eats those for brownies anyways. Right? That temptation is with you all day long. And such was the life of Jesus. Whereas you and I, we struggle with temptation and then sometimes we, we give in, we cave. We give in to the flesh, but then that temptation is over. Jesus endured temptation all day long, every day, because he never gave in. It was always there. He was always tempted to live his own way. He was always tempted to disobey the Father. He lived in that temptation all day, every day. And that's what makes Jesus a better high priest than us. Because there are many times you and I don't see sin coming or we minimize how strong the temptation truly is and we get caught in sin's web. Whereas Jesus can always see it coming. He knows how strong that temptation can truly get and how hard it is for us to truly resist sin. And so he's always before the Father saying, Lord, have mercy on him. I know how hard it is. I know how difficult it is. Have mercy on them. Have mercy on them. Have mercy on them. Similarly, many of us have probably gone through seasons when it seems as though God doesn't know what we're going through. Father, you don't know how hard it is here on this earth. Father, you don't know what it's like to lose a loved one who is as close to me as this person was. And we believe that because we think that if God knew exactly what our situation is, it, what our situation is, he would deliver us from it. But again, that's us trying to act as our high priest. Because when we're trusting that Jesus is our high priest, we would believe what the author of Hebrews tells us. That Jesus knows our struggles. He knows our temptations. And in fact, he knows them better than what we do. He knows how truly hard they really are. Because he experienced all those hurts and all those pains and all those sorrows and all those temptations while on earth to an even greater degree than us. Thirdly, Jesus is a better high priest because he was without sin, whereas we are not. Before the high priest entered into the most holy place on the Day of Atonement, he had to go through extensive cleaning protocols. He had to make sure his body was washed. He had to make sure his hands were washed. He had to make sure his clothes were washed. He had to make sure he had on the right clothes. And then prior to offering the sacrifice for the sins, he had to offer a sacrifice first for his own sins. And so if he got that order mixed up, if he went into the most holy place and he offered a sacrifice for the sins of the people, dead. If he got into that most holy place and he had forgot to wash his hands one last time, dead. If he had forgotten to change into the right priestly outfits, dead. So there was always this anxiety whenever the, the priests entered this most holy place on behalf of the people. In fact, there was so much anxiety that they would put bells on him 
And so they would hear him moving around, and just in case he ever dropped dead, then they would know, well, there's, there's no bells jingling, so that must mean that he's gone. He forgot a step. And they would tie a rope around his foot, so that way if he did die, they could pull him back through the curtain. There's always this anxiety. Well, maybe he's not able to represent us well today. Maybe he wasn't quite without sin. Maybe he, wasn't, maybe he forgot to offer the sacrifice for his sin at first. But such is not the case with Jesus, church. Though he was faced with the same temptations we are, and those priests were, Jesus was without sin. He faced the same kind of temptations, and yet was, not, was without sin. And therefore, you and I don't have to ever worry about Jesus' credibility before the Father. We don't have to ever question, will there be a time when Jesus screws things up and we lose our advocate? Will there ever be a time when he's not clean? Will there ever be a time when he's stricken dead before the Father's presence? Jesus is always clean. He's always perfect. He's always ready to intercede and advocate for us. Every single prayer that we offer, every single plea for mercy we offer, Jesus is ready. He's already perfect. He can already just take it straight to the Father. It's heard just like that. But again, many of us struggle with our worthiness as we offer these prayers before the Father. God, I, I, I want to ask for forgiveness, but I also know how I lived earlier today. And I just, I just don't know if you will forgive me. God, I need to ask you for forgiveness, but man, I, I'm feeling incredible guilt and incredible shame for how I treated this loved one in my life. God, I, I want to ask you for forgiveness today, but I also know I, I came to you yesterday and the day before and the day before that and the day before that with this same sin. And I, and I, I feel like at some point in time, like your, your grace, your mercy is going to run out. Again, church, these are all signs that we are trying to act as our high priest. Jesus is always perfect. And he's always before the Father. And so it doesn't matter how we live today. He's ready to take those pre or requests for forgiveness to the Father. It doesn't matter how we treated someone. He's ready to take that request for forgiveness to the Father. It doesn't matter if we sinned the same way yesterday and the day before that and the day before that and the day before that. He's always ready to take that new request to the Father. And the Father hears those requests because of the perfection of Jesus not because of our worthiness. Jesus' being perfect does not lead him to be judgmental towards us. His perfection leads him to sympathize with us in our weaknesses, and he pleads for us for mercy. So church, as we come before the Father, we can throw off our self-condemnation, we can throw off our guilt, we can throw off our shame. Because our requests are heard because of the perfection of Jesus. And that never changes. Fourthly, we see that Jesus is a better high priest because Jesus was chosen by God to represent us. In chapter 5, the author mentions that every priest was chosen by God to offer gifts and sacrifices for the sins of the people. In other words, no priest was ever self-appointed. They were all carefully selected by God in his wisdom. And the author of Hebrews points out that in verse 5, Jesus likewise did not exalt himself to be made high priest, was appointed by God as well. He quotes Psalm 2-7 and then Psalm 100, uh, chapter 100, verse 4, to show Jesus' appointment by the Father, both as a son and also as a priest. And in verse 7, we begin to see Jesus carry out some of these priestly duties. He offered up prayers and supplications with cries and tears to the Father, and he was heard. And the author goes on to say in verse 8 that although Jesus was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered, and having been made perfect, he became the eternal salvation to all who obey him. Now for all of us, those verses there should throw up some red flags of, wait a minute here, Jesus learned obedience, Jesus was made perfect, meaning that at one point in time he wasn't obedient, meaning at one point in time he wasn't perfect, wait it just feels like all of our faith should be crumbling to the ground right now based on these two verses. But what the author is simply saying here is that Jesus became complete in his human experience. That 
a priest in order to advocate for the people, remember, in order to sympathize with their weaknesses, had to understand what they went through. Jesus didn't have that up in heaven. He hadn't experienced what temptation was like. He didn't have to learn what it was to resist temptation and to live a perfect life. In other words, Jesus up in heaven before he came to earth wasn't qualified to be our high priest. But he came down to earth, he endured temptation, he learned what it was like to obey the Father, and now he's fully qualified. He's been made perfect. He's learned what it is to be obedient in the midst of temptation. And now he is perfectly suited to serve as our high priest in heaven. He's perfectly suited to offer up sacrifices for sins. We no longer have to question Jesus' qualifications. He has earned them. But yet you and I, so many times, we would rather represent ourselves before the Lord. In our pride, we would rather rely on our own righteousness. God, I'm feeling pretty confident today. I've, I've lived a pretty good life. I feel like you will hear these prayers today because of my obedience. No. Our prayers are always heard because of Jesus advocating for us. God chose him to represent us. Let us trust in him. Finally, we see that Jesus is a priest, or finally we see that Jesus will always live to advocate for us, and that's why he's a better high priest. We see in chapter 5 that Jesus is a priest in the order of Melchizedek. Uh, We'll study Melchizedek more in a few chapters, uh, so I don't want to go too deep into things uh, today, but what you need to know is that Melchizedek was an Old Testament priest and king. And he wasn't a priest in the order of uh, Aaron and the Levites. He was uh, a priest chosen by God separate from that. And so some may have been questioning, well, Jesus, is, is he really a priest? He's not a descendant of, of Levi or Aaron. He's a descendant of Judah, uh, so he can't be a priest. And so this is the Hebrew, author of Hebrews' way of saying, no, God can choose anyone he wants. And so there was this other priest, Melchizedek, who was also a priest. And so God can choose Jesus as well. And we see that in this passage. We see that as he quotes these two passages in Psalms, that God has chosen Jesus to serve as his son, to serve as a priest forever. And therefore, when we are struggling to overcome sin, we are in need of help in the midst of our trial. Or sorry, (laughs) sorry. What that means for us is that all these privileges we have seen today regarding Jesus as our high priest, we will get to experience as long as we live. Jesus is our king forever. He's our priest forever. Meaning there's no anxiety for us in the terms of like, well, Jesus will advocate for me today, but what if something happens to him tomorrow? Jesus will offer me salvation today, but what happens if something happens to him tomorrow? What if I die and I stand before the throne and and Jesus, who I was putting all my trust in, what if something happens to him? Who will be my advocate on that day? And the author of Hebrews says, we can have confidence. It'll be Jesus. He's our priest forever. He will not die. He will always live to intercede for us. He will always be before the Father. He will always sympathize with our weaknesses. He will always advocate for our sins on our behalf. We will receive mercy because Jesus is always before the Father. So then how do we apply all this good news that we've heard today? The author of Hebrews gives us two ways. First, as we seek to live in light of Jesus as our high priest, let us hold on to our confession of Jesus as our Lord and Savior. Church, hopefully today we've seen how different it is to rely on Jesus as our high priest versus ourselves as a high priest. But it's always tempting for us. It's always tempting for us in the midst of hardship, in the midst of sin, in the midst of uh, the weariness of this world, in the midst of all these trials to rely on ourselves, to doubt God's presence, to doubt God's nearness, to, to doubt whether Jesus will really advocate for us. But Jesus is perfect. None of these people have access to God like Jesus. None of these people understand our weaknesses like Jesus. None of these people will live as long as what Jesus does. None of these people were chosen by God like Jesus was. 
And therefore, when we're struggling to overcome sin, when we're needing help to live a holy life, let's hold fast to our confession that Jesus is our Lord, that Jesus is our Savior, that Jesus is our great high priest. Let's continue to trust in him. Secondly, the author encourages us to confidently approach God's throne, knowing we will receive mercy and grace. Church, what comes to mind when you think of the throne of God? Holiness, power, majesty, judgment, dread. Imagine you were to stand before the throne of God today, thinking through how you've lived your life this past week or these past couple weeks. What would be going through your heart? Fear? Guilt? Shame? Worry? The author of Hebrews says that if we are trusting in Jesus as our high priest, if we really understand what that means, there should be one word that we think of when we think of God's throne. Grace. Grace. God's favor towards us. Is that what you think of when you think of God's throne? Is that what you expect to receive when you ask the Lord for forgiveness? Is that what you expect to receive when you ask the Lord for help to overcome temptation? We should. Because Jesus is our high priest. Church, every time we sin and need forgiveness, we should be confident we will experience grace as we come into God's presence. Every time we need help overcoming sin, we should be confident we will experience the help we need. Every time we ask for something in prayer, we should expect and be confident that God in his grace will give us what is truly good for us. No matter the situation, no matter the trial, no matter the sin, God's throne is a throne of grace. So church, whatever sins you have committed this week, if you bring them before the throne of God today, you will, you will receive mercy. Whatever failures you've experienced this week, if you bring them before the throne today, you will receive mercy. Whatever trials, whatever sufferings, whatever hardships, if you bring them before the throne of the Lord today, you'll receive grace to help you in your time of need. That's the confidence that Jesus, as our high priest, gives us all the time. Every moment of every day, for every sin, for every trial, for every suffering, we will receive grace and mercy. So I want to close just by giving each of us time to go before the Lord's throne, to take whatever sins you've committed this week, to take whatever failures you've struggled with, to take whatever needs you have, and to go before the Lord's throne and to say, Lord, would you help me on behalf of Jesus? So let's bring those before the Lord now. In a little while, I'll close us in prayer.
Father, we thank you for your word today. And Father, I know that for many of us, it is a timely word. Father, as we deal with our sin, as we endure through these trials and temptations, Father, we are in need of help. For those of us who have lived unrighteous lives, lives apart from you, who have sinned in various ways this week, Father, we bring these before you. But Father, we don't bring them before you with anxiety or worry. We bring them before you with confidence. Not because of who we are or what we've done, but because of who Jesus is and what he's done for us. And so, Father, help us to believe that we will receive mercy for each one of our sins. That your mercy is never-ending. That your mercy is new every morning. That there is no sin that we could have committed. There is no sin that we could not have repeated. That you will not forgive in this moment. We cling to Jesus as our high priest and ask you to forgive us on his behalf. And Father, for all of us who are living in various trials and temptations and struggles, Father, we need your help. We confess that we have not been able to endure, that we're tired, that we're weary. So Father, we come before you. We come before your throne and we ask for grace. We ask for grace to overcome trials. We ask for grace to live faithfully, to live holy lives. And Father, as we cling to Jesus as our high priest, may we confidently leave this place knowing that you will give us the grace we need to live for you, to love you, to love others, to live in light of the gospel wherever we go. Father, may we continue this week to cling to Jesus as our high priest, to not live in the anxiety and the worry and the fear that comes with putting ourselves in that position, but to realize over and over, Jesus is better, Jesus is better, Jesus is better. We thank you that you are our high priest, that you are a better priest than us, and we thank you for the confidence that we will receive grace and mercy every time we are before your throne. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Suffered and cruel 
condemnation, no guilt, no shame, no worry, no anxiety. Such is what life looks like when we are trusting in Jesus as our great high priest. So church, let us go live in light of the gospel this week, trusting in Jesus as our high priest. He is better at that job than you or I. Jesus is better. Jesus is better. Jesus is better. You are sent to go live in light of the gospel this week.